want it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. And as usual, per usual, I get on one of the devices, it says we're live. On the other device, it says it's still pending. So we're just going to keep talking. And if you are watching and we're live, we are, this is our series of the building blocks. Building blocks, a practical guide to supporting kids and teens with learning disorders and academic and behavioral challenges. And if you didn't have those issues before, you might be this year in 2020, because it's a year of new experiences for everyone. But the great news for you is that we've got some answers. We are going through this series chapter by chapter, talking about all the things that could potentially impact you and your child from behavior, from the way they think cognitively, and even planning and preparing for your IEP or 504 if you if it does go that far and you need to go into the school and work with them. But today our topic is bullying topics, bullying, anxiety, and depression. This is chapter six, right in the middle. It is the first chapter in part three, talking about behavior, the behavioral process. And this is the conversation we've been having for the last month is all about behaviors. Um, in case you missed us, you can listen to the recordings. You can click on either the live tab or past events. And some of the conversations we've had already, personality, positivity, and growth mindset, uh, active listening, advocacy, affirmations, talking nice to your children, talking nice to yourself, what you can realistically expect and what's okay Maybe where are some of the boundaries of not being okay? And uh, the other day it was goals, attitude, and achievement. So we're wrapping up beha the behavioral section today, talking about um, bullying is the is the big topic, and it's going to be or topic, and it's going to be packaged with anxiety and depression. Which again, when Vicky wrote this book, anxiety probably wasn't near as pervasive and common as it is today. Um, and that's where we're at. So I'm here with, I am Mary Pat Cavanaugh, one of a, a concerned mom, you might call it, mm -hmm. and a mom that has benefited from the services at Thorpe Tutoring and um, Vicki Carroll. And Vicki is our author, esteemed author who wrote this book. Mm -hmm. And Nancy is our esteemed executive director of Thorpe Tutoring. And um, Nancy, why don't you start, tell, tell the audience who you are a little bit, and then we'll let Vicki talk. I'll pick up my a quick time. start, I'm finding that even with 35 years of experience, I'm, I'm opening up this book almost every day. So you need your own copy because it, it, there's so much information in there that we're just going to be grazing over. But I am Nancy Williams, director of Thorpe Tutoring, have been doing what I do for 35 years. Um, I have three children who are successful adults, and I have three grandchildren, and here we are. That's me. Okay. I, <laughs> quick one today. She has much more to offer than that, but that's just a, a little <laughs> clip of all the amazing things that Nancy does, and I feel so privileged to work with her and to um, empower kids that come to Thorpe as an academic therapist. Um, I, too, have uh, two grown children that work in the tech industry that had learning challenges growing up, and so I know what it feels like to be told by um, the neuropsychologist that your child has X, Y, and Z happening, and that's why they're struggling in school. Um, Nancy and I are fortunate that we're at the other end of the spectrum now, and we see our children um, succeeding as adults in spite of some of the challenges they had while they were in school. So as a therapist, what I do is I work with parents and the kids and the school um, and uh, try to build their learning um, continuum step by step. We know that learning disabilities don't go away, but I'm here to tell you that kids do learn to manage them and can be successful. And thank you to Mary Pat. She's far more than just a concerned mother. She was is a marketing that. guru and she is doing an amazing job. Mm. Yes, and I, I will say Mary Pat is my marketing director and she, is, she is, does a great job for my company. And one other thing I'm gonna say this book is not only for parents, but as I have my oldest grandchild is five. So it's if you're a concerned grandma or grandpa, this would be good a good book to maybe buy for your your children, for their own children. 
There you go. And, uh, and I also have children with um, learning disorders, uh, definitely the academic behavioral challenges that go hand in hand with all of that. Um, bullying is such a hot topic and, and hot, I think, if you've experienced it, if one of your children have experienced it. Um, to my knowledge, only one of my, my girls actually, as a, a mom of four, only one of my girls experienced regular bullying that was recurring and chronic. It was really not just a one-off experience. And um, we tried changing schools. We tried working with the teachers in the school. And it just seemed that until she actually had a proper diagnosis, it was like she was a magnet for the mean people. And, um, and it was so sad and so heartbreaking. Um, so I'd like to really get into this. And um, and this is one that I just feel like pulls at the heartstrings. So, but we're gonna be fine. We're gonna talk about it. It might be emotional. And maybe, you know what, we need to just uh, give permission for this. This is a very emotional um, topic. So with that being said, Vicki, I'm gonna toss this over to you. Maybe talk to us about why um, it's the first chapter in the section of behaviors and why, why did you even lead with it? What, tell me why it's so important as it relates to learning disorders and such. Well, most people experience some form of bullying throughout their lifetime. I did. I had a horrible sixth grade year. Um, I seemed to be um, tossed to and fro from mean girl to mean girl. And it really affected my self-esteem. My son also um, extre oh, experienced extreme bullying in sixth grade, even when it got to the point of physical um, um, an impact, um, being invited to parties and then being physically harmed at those parties. And so it's really an important subject. And oftentimes kids don't share because they don't understand or they feel embarrassed, they wanna be accepted. And we know that bullying is when um, one or groups of people seek um, to harm, intimidate, or coerce. Um, and usually, oftentimes they do pick on the vulnerable, um, those kids that maybe um, don't come across as having um, the esteem that others do. And girls involve, get involved more in racial, a relational aggression. And that's a type of bullying that can go unnoticed. It's not as outward. Books, it's um, talking behind someone's back um, and just building um, groups to turn against a single child. And so a lot of times this goes unnoticed and we don't even know as parents it's happening, but we, we do, do see that our, our child is changing. They're spending more time in the room. Maybe they're not um, reaching out to friends as much. Their demeanor is is of a more you know depressed. They 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 seem to lack esteem. And so, we really need to watch out for that because kids are very crafty in the way that they try to damage or sabotage a child's um, relationships and social status. So that's kind of what bullying is. Um, and some kids just seem to be easy targets. And I know my son who seemed to be an easy target, um, he never came to us. I actually was um, at the school to pick him up for an appointment, um, orthodontist appointment, and he was still out on the playground with friends. And so I walked out on the playground to find him and there were a large group of children at the back of the playground that I walked up to. And this gets emotional for me. My son was in the center of a circle of about um, 20 kids and they were mocking and kicking him. And um, that's when I really realized that this was um, much greater than just a few unkind words that it had turned physical. So the school got involved, we got him into counseling and you know, as an adult, he's doing well, but um, that was just terrifying for me as a mother. I felt so helpless and hopeless. And, it had gotten so big by the time I realized that he was um, in a situation that he didn't know how to handle and he didn't know how to correct. And so he just kind of took it. And um, so 
Oftentimes it doesn't get to that point. I wish that I'd known sooner so I could have stepped in because as a sixth grader, he just didn't know how to help himself and he didn't know the cause of it. So research tells us that kids in junior high, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, because their bodies are changing and there's a lot of imbalance there that they seem to be a little bit more involved and aggressive in bullying. And then as kids move into high school, it seems to, you know, be a little more tempered. But that's just my personal experience and why I feel that this chapter is extremely important because it then led to um, depression for him. Wow. My, um, my experience as a mom, which was also not just feeling hopeless um, and, you know, mama bear wants to kick in, but I was really grateful that there was a, um, some kind of after school session or something um, or some, I remember it was an outside, maybe it was a program on TV and my daughter was watching it and the light bulb went off and it wasn't until that point, And she was maybe about the same age as your son, maybe a little bit younger. It wasn't until that point that she had the language to say, oh, I know what it was. It was a girls on the run program. Mm. And it was one of their sessions, which they're about running and self-esteem. And um, she didn't have the language or even understand that what was happening to her was personal and it was not okay. Right. And um, it was get her giving the language. And so whether your child is, you know, has a moment or somebody notices it, um, and then we can start to fix it. Nancy, I'm sure in your position, you've probably witnessed or, um, or heard conversations about this topic as well with the many children that you've seen come through. So. Right. My, before I forget this thought, my, my thought also was, um, you know, I like the saying, be kind. And I think a lot of kids don't even know they're being bullies. And for us, it, we, on the, there's also the end where we need to teach our children what to, what behavior a bully does and, and could our own children be bullies. Um, I think that's very important in the example we set and how we teach our children as they're growing up, the words we use, how we treat people. Um, it's important because kids learn from example. So I did want to give that thought. Um, I don't, you know, with working with kids one-on-one, -on -one, I don't really hear as many stories as you'd think. Probably teachers see it more than I do, but I do have the kids with anxiety. They don't always talk about it and some are depressed and I'm sure that feeds into it. I have one daughter who did tell me about it. We got to nip it in the bud and my other daughter probably didn't tell me enough. And, and so um, it's tough because it's just to have an open conversation with your children about here's what bullying is. Are you experiencing that or are you um, making it worse for somebody? Are you being a, 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 an inactive participant by standing back and watching? Or are you being an active participant doing the bullying or are you being bullied? Mm -hmm. I just think, and there, there's, and classes, school teachers, they, they do talk about it a lot more in school. It's just, it still happens though. It does. And I think it's important to help the child shift from feel, feeling vulnerable to I can be in control. Yes. I can set boundaries. I can say no. I do have support. There's people I can go to. That doesn't make me a weak person. That makes me a strong person. Right. And we need to point out that girls often bully through words and isolation, where boys, it's more psychological and physical behavior. And my son experienced all of them because the bullying involved boys and girls. So I think it, like Nancy said, the support is critical and they need to learn to be able to speak up and say, don't push me yes. or don't, or don't push that person. person and set those boundaries because when kids hear that, then it's maybe they're like, oh, okay, well maybe I shouldn't have said that. And so in giving some kids the benefit of the doubt, maybe they say things not realizing that they're bullying. Right. Um, and so to teach a child to set those up those boundaries and walls and say, don't push me, don't talk to me that way. I don't appreciate what you're saying. Not to be mean back necessarily, but boundaries are extremely important and then to walk away. Sometimes it's just a matter of walking away and finding someone to support you, whether it's someone at school or someone at home. 
um, to give them that extra support because bullying can have really adverse reactions on younger children and teens as well and cause a lot of stress for parents. One of the things that we discovered when we finally did get our diagnosis um, was that the likelihood for some of these issues, um, bullying, anxiety, and depression goes exponentially up mm -hmm. with um, the connection with these um, some of these diagnoses. So my daughter's diagnosis definitely is often packaged with uh, anxiety and depression uh, in part because they just don't they feel so different and like they don't fit in and they become easy targets and this well, is where this I, book will help you as parents because and in, in, in moving on with the bullying I mean Vicki has stra strategies to navigate it she can talk more about that but how how to teach she has a verbiage to teach your child gives you kind of a roadmap to help you with your child because we don't know what to do. That's what is so good about this. And what I love about the Vicki's book here is that um, the action steps to bullying, these aren't just things that we can do, but we need to empower our children. Right. They have to be able to take a stand for themselves. That's and hard to learn. It is hard to learn, but what I have also, at least in our situation, um, because some of the social skills are missing, she's, and my daughter's old enough, she's a teenager. So she's able to understand and recognize that socially she's just, she misses cues. She just misses some of this stuff that happens. And so she is personally motivated to learn some of these things. She has an increased um, desire to learn it. And because she can learn it without the emotional filter on it, she can set that aside and say, you know what? I can do the, I can speak up. I can walk away from a bully. But before she didn't know that she even had permission mm -hmm. to do those things. Well, and I think teaching kids how to cope Yes. Uh, what's the difference between emotion-focused coping and problem-focused coping? And emotion-focused coping is when we just deal with the negative emotion. That's all we see. So it blinds the child from being able to see a solution. They just get so trapped in the emotion of it and start to feel helpless. And maybe they blame themselves or blame the way they look or blame, you know, certain situations. And that's emotion and that's natural. But if we can shift their thinking to more problem focused coping, identify what's causing the problem, the stress, and it might not even be anything they're doing, but like you say, to give them permission to say, this is wrong, this is a concern, and I have the power to set boundaries to you know, resist the emotional components of the bullying. And so, being better at self-advocacy, reaching out for social support, and re really realizing, I think this is the biggest key, perceiving the situation is really within their capacity to have some control. I so agree. When they're emotion-focused, they let go of control. When they're problem-focused, they take back the control and say, I can walk away, I can get help, I can get support. And that's huge. It's monumental. That's the turning point. And as parents, I think we just want to go talk to the principal and talk to the parents and defend our children. However, if you use some of Vicky's strategies, it gives the child some power too. We can't take away that power from the child. I mean, we want to be, I'll be mama bears and fix the problem, but we're not going to really fix the problem unless the child can understand and how they have power and control as well. Yeah. So and before going to the school, just one point that I learned is documenting dates, times. So mm -hmm. if you do have to get into the school, you're not, you know, we forget. So you have documentation and that really helps as well. And even if you if you seek out other kind of support, um, it's not about the blame game, but it's about documentation. This is a real situation and it's been going on this long. And I think that's empowering. And then together with support groups or other people, you can brainstorm other, set, other strategies to help empower the child and empower yourself as the parent. Mm -hmm. 
statistics that you've got in here, one out of four kids are bullied. 77% of students are bullied mentally, verbally, and physically. And cyberbullying statistics are 43%. I don't wonder if that's gone up in the last six oh, months. Absolutely. Probably. And you know, research varies. So as a writer, you 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 look at all the research and, and kind of go middle of the road. Um, but cyber, see, that's something our generation didn't experience. It was face-to-face -face bullying or, you know, that nonverbal. But it 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 seems so easy for kids now to be able to um, bully online and cyberbullying because they're kind of removed. It gives them power to be removed from the situation and and well and they're on social media and they see all of the bad examples from adults that are bullying each other. Yes. And we've media. seen a lot of that lately, haven't we? Yes. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> wow. And there's more statistics in here. But um I, I'd like to focus on the like ah oh, Let's focus on um, the great things here. And, and this is all such good, really important stuff. Um, the information here, it's, and we've said this before and it warrants being said again, and we've even said it in this call, the, the information in this book is not just information. Like the, yeah, there's, there's statistics, but there's actionable things that you can do to take this information, learn from it, and then make a change for yourself and your child. And, uh, and sharing that information, getting your, your family and your loved ones and your friends or teachers or whatever on board with this information um, and how to have these conversations. So stress and personality um, is part of this chapter as well. And so, um, Let's let's talk about that. I mean, stress, everybody has stress. Vicki, so why did you feel like it was important to bring that in here into this? Well, like you mentioned, everybody has stress and it's very multifaceted. A lot of it comes back to the five factor model personality. Um, your extrovert is probably going to have an easier time expressing um, concerns of um, stress than perhaps the introvert. Um, people that are really high in agreeableness um, might put up with it more than the person that's not. I mean, and everybody is different in different situations and nobody is a cookie cut. I mean, we don't just fit into one little segment, but I think in looking at our children, this my son that 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 um, was bullied, he, he, he is more introverted and um, um, I would say had lower self-esteem than my younger son at the at the sixth grade level. And so he became kind of an easy target. And so, um, and being my oldest, I, I just wasn't aware. I mean, I just was a little, I have to admit, clueless until it just escalated to a point that was not only dangerous for him physically, but also emotionally and mentally. And anxiety and stress did play a huge part in that. And um, that landed, that lasted much longer than the actual bullying just what it did to him and helping him come back from those experiences to feel empowered again and feel like he was worthwhile and that he could contribute. And part of it was that um, he has a very high IQ and some of his social skills were not as developed. And so as my husband and I really um, got him into counseling and learned from the counselor, we realized that um, a lot of the stress and anxiety he then felt from the bullying situation, we had to deal with that long after the bullying stopped. And we know globally that one in 13 suffer from anxiety. And like you said, probably now people are experiencing anxiety that maybe they hadn't before. So kids who experience anxiety, they aren't faking it. Um, they need to... Um, understand that they don't invite it into their lives. They're not asking for it. It's just a response to other things going on. And some are more prone to anxiety. It falls under the, the neuroticism part of the big, the five factor model. We all have a neuroticism part um, to it. Can you, um, I know we talked about it in other calls, but can you share 
what the five factor model of personality or OCEAN is the acronym for it, O-C-E-A-N. Right, right. Well, the neuroticism piece is basically depression, anxiety, um, some of the insecurity pieces. Um, um, openness is being open to new experiences. Some people are more open than others to new experiences. It doesn't mean that they don't engage in them. They're just easier to, it's easier to accept them. Um, um, adaptability is simply what that says, just being adaptable. I am lower in adaptability. I have to really feel comfortable with something before I'm just quick to adapt. I analyze a lot. Um, then we have our introversion and our extroversion is actually the E is extroversion, the person that's more outgoing. Um, and then you have, um, the person that's a little less outgoing. And there's so many variations to all of this. And I think I've left one out. The conscientiousness. Thank you, conscientiousness. And thank you. That's just crossing T's and dotting I's. That's the person that gets their homework in and gets things done and never misses an appointment. But again, you know, there's ways to adapt to that. I mean. I have one son who's fairly low in that. And wow, with apps on his phone and stuff, he's able to track his calendar and make things happen. And a lot of kids that have some executive uh, dysfunction can be a little lower in the conscientiousness piece where they're just not, you know, giving up or they're not just, they just have a hard time tracking and keeping up with some of the demands of turning things in and being places on time. And so as parents, we need to look at this and say, this isn't a rebellion. This is a, they aren't rebelling here. This is just part of who they are. And we all have the positive and the negative piece of the five factor. You know, even as an extrovert, that can be a great asset, but sometimes we extroverts have to stand back and just, I'm, you know, I'm a little more. Each one of these is kind of a continuum and we show up in different places on all five of these. And just times in the situation that could be a str strength and in other times it could be, we can do a little, uh, you know, a little detriment or a little learning. The extrovert's hand is constantly going up in class, right? To answer all the questions. Sometimes we need to give other people an opportunity to share their opinions. So, so just to recap the five factor <laughs> model of personality, it was, O is the openness to experience. C is conscientiousness. E is extroversion versus introversion. Right. A is agreeableness, agree agreeability. Agree mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah. Agreeableness. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I'm struggling with that word today. And the N is neuroticism, and so that spells out the O C E A N of ocean. Right, and what we're talking about today with the anxiety and stress, that falls under the N, under the neuroticism. And we all have th that component in our personality, different, differing degrees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nancy, what, what do you have to add to this? Well, just that I'm thinking of a, of a family that I help and one, one sibling definitely um, coping with the demands of school are really stressful for him. And at the beginning of the year, it was a real, so many of our kids are having a rough start because they're having trouble coping with everything, all the instructions being online. There aren't as many worksheets handed out. It's just very different. And he, and he was experiencing headaches, anxiety, avoidance. And that was his personality, his way to deal with it. So we needed him to really come in and recognize it. Whereas his sister who's very conscientious is not having those issues. So that personality style definitely um, can affect you. And I think you've got to determine from this book, you can determine, okay, what's my child's main personality? Um, what profile. is it called? Personality complex or profile, mm -hmm. right? So that I can help them. This makes you as a parent think, okay, let me dig into this and I can help my child instead of just putting your hands up and saying, this kid drives me crazy or this kid's just lazy. <laughs> right. Well, and that our personalities do really they, they kind of navigate us. And so right. for someone that is very introverted, it's very difficult for them to be very extroverted. And there's right. nothing wrong with that. Right. You know, we are who we are and, yeah. and we draw upon those strengths. And one other thought on stress, when people feel stress, they generally want to fight or flee. It's just a natural mm -hmm. response. 
you know, if you're being chased by a bear in the forest, you better flee, right? So when kids feel a stress level or an anxiety level caused by a myriad of different things, some of it based on personality, some of it just based on circumstances, they either want to fight or flee. And fighting, by fighting, I don't mean it in a negative term, but when it comes to bullying, sometimes that guard or, or standing up for yourself, fighting for yourself, not in a physical um, way, but of just saying, stop, don't talk to me that way is really good. Other times leaving the situation is much more appropriate. We don't ever want kids to put themselves in harm's way. Um, and sometimes um, standing up and advocating is the right answer and other times walking away is, but they need to understand what works best. We help them with that. And as they mature, they get better at identifying which is appropriate in given situations. But most often we don't want kids to just bury their head and walk away, whether it's not doing homework, standing up for themselves, um, asking questions. We want them to become confident in themselves, their abilities and use their voice, use their voice. That's very powerful. You know, when I, if I would have read this book years ago, I would have put my daughter in the extroversion because she's such an introvert. She does not have a problem going to anybody. But in this particular context, the neuroticism is, um, it definitely plays a huge role with her. Like it is motivating every decision she makes throughout the day. Um, and I had no clue about that. Um, I really thought she was just being dramatic and I just didn't put those pieces together like that. And in fact, when we talk about the fight or flee, um, for her, fleeing in the classroom looked like reading a book. book. Like she will read a book. She used to get in trouble for sneaking the books under her desk and reading instead of being present. And that's her escape. That was completely how she numbed herself to everything else that was happening. Right. Yep. Right. And you know, sometimes escaping is okay. Um, it, it's having the maturity to know when to do that and when it's appropriate and when it's not. Because sometimes when kids escape, we escape, we move, we move ourselves from the situation and we can gather our thoughts and regroup. Mm -hmm. And so again, that's not always a negative. We just have to decide when it's appropriate and teach our children when it's not. Yeah. <laughs> and for, for those kids who are not suffering every day from anxiety or bullying or depression, but maybe test anxiety is a real thing. And um, talk, talk about that. I mean, that's that's, I think, more common. That's easier for people to, I, I don't know if it's easy. Maybe I'm, there's a lot of stories in my head about all of this. I'm not really <laughs> sure what real, you need to check. Well, me on. Sometimes we draw on our own experience too. And everything is so broad. In in these broadcasts, I just want to point out that we're sharing personal experiences, but that doesn't mean they're set in stone. Every There's such a broad spectrum on all of this discussion and everyone doesn't fit into one piece of it, you know? And so when it comes to like test anxiety, some kids might have no anxiety when it comes to tests for US history or writing a paper, but when it comes to math, oh my gosh, it's off the charts for them. So that can vary as well. And then sometimes not to throw anything back on the child, but sometimes those anxieties, um, increase based on the world around them. And I think that's what we're seeing now. I mean, it's not just COVID, it's Black Lives Matters, it's the election. There's so much going on that this situation is a perfect example of how a child who maybe exhibited no anxiety or stress is exhibiting more because this week we're online because schools closed due to COVID, but we're going back into this classroom in two weeks. There's just a lot of adapting that has to take place and we become better at adapting as we mature. And we're expecting our, our young children to adapt to some, you know, 
stressful situations. And so can I just share a couple of ideas on test anxiety and how to maybe... Please do that. Yeah, of course, please. And yes, I think yeah, one of the best ways for kids to, you know, alleviate some test anxiety is to be, simply be prepared, not to cram, not to start studying 10 minutes before the test during lunch, you know, to, although, to, be prepared to do it in segments. Although okay. cramming does have, if you're well prepared, a good cram session <clears throat> is the best way before a test. So I you can't just cram, but if you're prepared, um, to review things quickly is good. Yes, right before the test. Okay. Right before the test. Um, focus on that positive self-talk. I can do this. I'm prepared. Um, I'm not going to let past experience um, control what I do today on this particular test. Um, focus on the test as I'm going to perform well. I'm not going to perform poorly. And to not worry about things going on around them, just to really try to focus on the exam. Um, create that reliable support system again prior to going into the test. And then there's times when the child will maybe due to extreme um, test anxiety need some kind of classroom um, accommodation. And there are a list of classroom accommodations here in the book. Right. Uh, you know, you find the ones that work and you work with your, your school. Your and let me just add, I think sharing, I've had so many students that have been anxious and I've been anxious too these past six weeks. I mean, it's been a really, it's been rough. And for me to share my anxiety to them makes them feel more normal. Like I have anxiety that that academic coach over there, she was anxious yesterday, you know, sharing our experiences so that they know that because a lot of kids think they're alone, that they're the only ones that have it and there's something wrong with them. And that it's okay. It's normal. It's right. natural. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's really important in all of what we were talking about. That came up for me when you were talking earlier about bullying um, and we want to help our children, um, but it's important to validate them for what they're feeling, even if we're not feeling it with them. You know, maybe you're not feeling anxious because of the pandemic and schools and everything else, but, um, but your child, your child might be. And, um, and that's really huge. You look like you were raising your hand. Oh, sorry, no, but I, I do. Ha I do have another comment about that. I was thinking about about testing. I actually wasn't. Um, but if the kids, if kids can make it through junior high and high school, and if we have the accommodations to help them, sometimes, sometimes educators fight back a little bit because they're not working with. In my population of kids, the ones that can I work with, a lot of our kids have these emotional, behavioral, cognitive struggles. And these accommodations, if it's your child, they will help them get through these difficult years of middle school and high school. And as we get older, tests become a little easier. We become, we become more mature. It's, 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 it's to keep our kids above water during these times. So remember, as you're speaking to your educational team, that you know these accommodations are not to get them off the hook. It's to help get them through and keep their esteem and their confidence intact. That's important. Yeah. And I also think that we need to realize that the words we use with our kids are critical um, and that feeling sad or unhappy sometimes is not depression. So not to say to them, well, you're always depressed. Well, that word might instill in them a feeling of hopeless, helpless, um, it's better to use a word like, I, I feel like you're unhappy today, or I feel like something's bothering you today. There's some words like depressed that can trigger um, a reaction that then kind of causes a downward cascading motion. And so power of words is very, very important. But with that being said, parents need to watch that and make sure that they keep an eye on the situation so that it doesn't escalate to the point like it did with my son, where there was a lot more to it than just feeling unhappy and sad. Another word I suggest that, that I always in my training with my, with my tutors and coaches, I ask them not to use is that you have a bad attitude. That's a word with a lot of triggers for kids. Instead, when, like Vicki said, it seems like you're having a bad day. What's going on? You don't seem to be yourself. What's going on? Because they, that, that's kind of a, all of us adults, that's kind of a trigger word. And even, you know, I think as teachers, as parents, as everybody, we've got to watch how we use that word. 
So it's right. not just an attitude. They might be shutting down and therefore they look like they have a bad attitude, but they're shutting down. Right. I was just going to segue into something else, but go ahead. That, that goes back to one of the things we talked about in a previous one of these episodes um, about um, giving feedback on the behavior, not the person. And there's something about, you know, you have a bad attitude that is very closely related to you are bad, like versus mm -hmm. you're having a bad day, which is more about the experience, the behavior, something outside that you can then control. Because if you are a bad person or you, you know, it's harder to change something that's inherent within you. It's easier to change something outside of you. Right. There's, there's my un no, I think, I think, just, I'm just a mom. <laughs> Be no, down. no, you're not. But it's not, we've mentioned it before. It's that five to one ratio. We hold on to negatives. We don't let, I can, I can remember things that were said to me in fifth and sixth grade. And I'm like, why am I still holding on to that? That doesn't define me. And so it's the five positives that it takes to cancel the one the one negative and choice of words are important. And to, if we say a word, like you seem to have a, be having a bad day, you know, let's talk about it to give the child an opportunity to open up and express. And I think we have to be aware of when does this maybe cross over to depression and realizing that we don't cause our children to have depression, that it can be biological, emotional, it can come from lots of different areas and uh, uh, another statistic is that about 20% of people with learning disorders will experience some type of depression. Some of the research that I found on that. So oftentimes they're, they're, they're coupled, you know, you, you see that. Um, but the good news in all of this is that there's opportunities for support, accommodations and modifications through the school, coaching um, through Thorpe. There are opportunities to give our children the best advantage they can have to navigate the challenges that they're faced with. And depression too, it, it has to be professionally diagnosed. Um, you know, oftentimes say, oh, I'm having such a, I'm so depressed today. You know, that really just means I'm having a really bad day. But for something to be diagnosed as depression, it has to meet certain criteria in the DSM-5 and that has to be done by a professional to diagnose that. And that's also listed in the book. And I really did that after one of my students um, was diagnosed with that and, and had done harm to herself to, uh, prior to the diagnosis. And I thought, you know, it, it's a touchy subject, but we really do need to um, let parents know what depression looks like and certain criteria needs to be met. And when that occurs, it's, it, it really does require professional support. And I um, want parents beyond to know. Beyond what Nancy and I and the other coaches can offer. And I want parents to know that they can get a 504 plan or an IEP based on depression and anxiety. It's called Other Health Impaired, and it can cover ADHD, can cover diabetes, can cover cancer. There's lots of things, but those, those things are, you can, because kids, even though they may be very cognitively have a good IQ, they're smart, they can understand the material, the stress negates a lot of that. And so that's where they need those classroom modifications and accommodations for that. And that is available. You just have to know who to ask and where to go. And this book will give you ideas. And about, you have to know that you can ask. Yes, Nancy, exactly. I had no idea. This is brand new information. We didn't teach you that back when? No. It's nice no. to see it. It's nice to see it on paper. It is. You know, because there are probably times when we, we mention things, who knows, but it, it, it's really good to have the book and look at it and think about well, your child you as you're reading. book into the IEP or 504 yes. and be able to say, this is what I know my rights are, my child's rights are, this is what I want. Because yes. Nancy and I can't go to every IEP and 504 meeting with every parent no. across the United States. So it's a book that you can take that gives you the solid background yes. to be able to advocate and if a child is diagnosed with, with uh, depression, they need to know it's not their fault. No. That's not something they're asking for. And that, that can drive additional anxiety and stress. And yes. so I guess my ending or parting thought would be that in writing the book, 
if I'd only had this at my disposal 25 years ago, I would have felt so empowered as a parent to be able to say, this is what my child needs. This is what I want. This is what I expect. And this is what we need to, you know, make happen. And I have found having worked, you know, East and West Coast in, in the school systems that, that the schools by and large are supportive and the teachers do want what's best for the child, but your child isn't the only one they're working with that has, you know, a 504 IEP. And sometimes I think they just get a little overwhelmed in defense of the, the, the teachers and administrators. Um, so uh, as parents, we need to just be a little more forceful and follow up. And that's what this book is so good for, is to give that hands-on I want to read Vicki's last paragraph about depression that ends the chapter. It's recommended that the child or teen be evaluated by a medical professional for the appropriate treatment if they truly are exhibiting symptoms of depression and anxiety. Remember that depression, like any other mental condition, is not your fault or your child's fault. It is simply another facet of life that they must learn to live with. And like any other issue, it can be dealt with appropriately through love, support, and the necessary accommodations. Mm. Um, that was a really powerful paragraph. Thank you. Thank you for reading that. And thank you for writing that, Vicki. This is good. Well, so to get the book, because you all need the book, I'm <laughs> going to share my screen. Um, and I'm going to show you where to go to get the book. And we're also going to do our drawing, announce the winners from today's. Um, we have a whole bunch of uh, gifts that you can win here. So the first thing that you want to do, and this is in the comment thread below, is go to thoratutoring.com forward slash building dash blocks. And that will bring you here. If you just go to thoratutoring.com, you can get to this page through the menu under resources. <clears throat> and depending on when you're listening to this um, recording, you can also, probably something might pop up on your screen as well. But you can click here or you can read our lovely story about why this is so important and why the book was written from both Nancy and um, Vicki and some of the specifics. And then come down here, buy your book over on Amazon, and then make sure to come back to this screen with your little order number, which you'll find in your Amazon um, cart. You can click on orders and find it. And then fill out this form right here. This will give you access to all the bonuses that we have and um, to the drawing prizes as well. And the bonuses include discounts on your initial evaluation or first tutoring session at Thorup Tutoring. Um, Dr. Serpis is donating $100 off a neurological neuro neuro psychological evaluation. So if that's something that you need, she's th there's a great deal right there. And um, Summit Community Counseling, which also provides a variety of different counseling, ongoing support um, for all different levels, including testing. Um, every single patient, new and current, who purchases the book will get a $20 Amazon gift card. And the instructions on how to access those bonuses are on the next page. So come back here, click Give Me Access after you've put the information in, and um, you will see how to uh, collect any or all of those bonuses can be yours. Um, if you want to get them all, you can have them all. So drawing prizes include certificates uh, to Nordstrom Olive Garden Down East Target, um, Zoom chats. Um, one of these, Vicki, is no longer available as of this moment. Is it the parent consultation? No, the one below it. The IEP. For yes. meeting. So the, the parent consultation is still available. Um, In-person assessment of child's academic challenges also available. And the super cute matted print from Vicki's sister also available. And we will be doing these drawings at each one of these um, live sessions. So it's a first come first serve, which is why I wasn't really sure which one of these was missing. And um, we'll try to keep that updated as soon as we can. Um, 
as often as we can. There's some really great testimonials from some experts around the community, as well as some parents. So take a moment and read some of these. Make sure you go to thoroughtutoring.com forward slash building dash blocks to purchase your book and to access um, your bonuses and be in the um, lineup for potentially winning a drawing. So um, we have two winners today, right? Two winners, yes, two winners today. Thank you. See, that's why I need you guys. <laughs> Not only are my is my tongue getting tied, our winners today, if you are listening or if you know, Diane Baker is our first winner and Karen Beckstead is our second winner. And again, right. prizes are first come, first serve. So if you want to uh, contact Nancy or shoot us an email, um, or you can go to the website and fill out the contact form and say, I won. Um, I will contact you if you win, but if you want the bonuses, yeah. you may need to do that. And yes, so we will also contact you. We will get a hold of you. Um, but if you don't want to wait for that and get, you know, the, the prize that you're looking for, then make sure that um, you give us a call. Give Nancy a call. So <laughs> ladies, this was really great. Really, really fabulous. Thank you again. I do want to say that our next um, event that we're doing, I think we've got two of these a week for the next few weeks. And our, our next uh, Facebook Live that we're doing, I'm just going to go to the events page. And that way I'm not trying to go from memory or my calendar. And according to Facebook, if you're with us on Facebook, and I'm not, my page is not loading. So that Tuesday, didn't work. Tuesday, 1030, Tuesday, October 5th, okay. October 6th at 1030, and Thursday, October 8th at 10. Okay, so those are our next couple. And yes. I believe our next topic, we're going to switch over and start talking about the cognitive processes. We spent the last uh, few weeks talking about the behavioral processes, and now we're moving into how you think. And specifically, it will be chapter two, learning, memory, and thinking styles. So join us. And if you do want to just plug in some questions, we will answer those questions for you um, on the calls. So thanks, ladies. Thank you. Have a great week. Okay. See you later. Bye -bye.